thank you astro stem labs for inviting me to this talk especially dilip and meena and and thank you alfino for introducing me so my name is vishnu nandan i am a researcher based out of university of calgary and also a, an affiliate at university of manitoba and also at university of waterloo so i have three affiliations uh, i am a polar researcher i i work with frozen ocean waters so i walk on frozen ocean waters i drill through frozen ocean waters and that's my that's my research i use uh, satellites uh, to to study the thickness change of these frozen ocean waters and we call it as sea ice s e a i c e so just to give you a perspective so uh, i'm sure that you know my, most of them are from kerala from here so if you go to a beach or let's say if you go to a beach in canada you would only see the ocean right but just imagine if that ocean is like completely frozen up that means you know the whole of the ocean is 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 frozen up and it's ice so that's called as sea ice and uh, the sea ice occurs both in the in the arctic and in the antarctic okay So in the Arctic, we call it as Arctic sea ice. In the Antarctic, it is called as the Antarctic sea ice. Uh, but how did I? So, so I am from Trivandrum in Kerala, where people have never seen snow or ice for the past like ten thousand years. So, so people always ask me like, you know, how I jumped from Kerala and came to Canada and studied this. So it's it's a very usual question. So it, it's never been. Uh, it's not been a very easy road to become a polar scientist. So, uh, so I am basically an engineer. I I used to be an engineer. So, if you if you read the 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 lines from the bottom, so I did my after my twelfth standard. Uh, I studied in Krishnagar School in Trivandrum. so then i joined university of kerala for my electronics and communication engineering so i was a very pretty mediocre student there and i was working with tata consultancy services after my engineering but i didn't like the job so i left the job and then i was jobless for like an year this happened like you know almost like 10 15 years ago and then i did then you know i didn't know what else to do and that's when uh, i thought in i should do something different so i did a, i did my masters msc in earth observation science uh, from uh, so in netherlands the united nations they have a, an institute it's called as the itc where they teach you remote sensing so or earth observation science so what is that so people send satellites you know nasa european space agency the indian space agency they send satellites up in the space and these satellites you know they rotate around the earth and they take they take yeah. pictures of they take pictures they take pictures of uh, of our planet and what we do is we analyze these images and they study and we study based on these images and how these earth features change etc etc so that's what's called as earth observation science and you i my specialty was to use like radar images uh, black and white radar images of the earth features uh, so initially i worked with forest features to study the forest height changes uh, using radar images so that was my first expertise and then right after my masters uh, before doing my phd uh, i did a research associateship at the alfred wegener institute so alfred wegener was a was a great scientist who proposed uh, uh, continental drift theory so he has a polar institute in germany and that's when i shifted from forestry to antarctic ice sheets and that's when i first went to uh, went to the antarctic so uh, that was again like 10 10 12 years ago and then i was like okay since i have been to the south pole you know i should also study something on the north pole and that's when i thought like okay i should uh, do my phd uh, my doctorate and that's why i came to canada and Five years ago, I finished my PhD uh, from the University of Calgary, uh, where I shifted again from Antarctic ice sheet to Arctic sea ice. So I'll explain a bit about you know what Arctic sea ice is. And from then, 
to now i have been doing like multiple postdoctoral fellowships so, so right now i'm doing my third postdoctoral fellowship but i am also affiliated as a research scientist in in three other organizations so this is this has been my journey uh, over these past many odd years so i've been lucky enough very fortunate enough to be here and to to share my experiences with 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 every one of you uh, just to just to give you an idea of what life is and how you can change your life based on what you love so this is these are the these are the places where i am where i have been over these years in the geographic uh, i mean north of arctic circle that includes the includes the north pole and also regions in the norwegian arctic the alaskan arctic the canadian arctic sectors and also in the siberian arctic so every year uh, we we conduct expeditions where you know, we go to these places not to all these places every year uh, but these these are the places you know where i have been uh, north of arctic circle and in the in in the antarctic so i have mostly been uh, in the on sea ice so not directly right in the middle of south pole uh, because that's not my expertise where i am coming from Uh, but we work out of different research stations uh, owned by different countries where we conduct research out of it so that's where you know we also do it so next year uh, i'm going to rothra which is a british station where i'll be doing an overwintering overwintering is you stay in a research station for one long year uh, and then manage the research station and then conduct research from that station so you won't be going back to your homeland you know in between this one year so that's how our research works. that's how, that's why it's called as overwintering it's a, it's a botanical term but we use it uh, sometimes in polar research to uh, to show that so uh, i'm just showing a bit about myself for now and then i'll i'll shift to what what we do uh, what we do so uh, this is how my life is so my life is either during polar darkness for like six long months a year or it will be like six long months of like sunlight so it i do, i normally don't have a life where my my uh, my mornings start with sunrise and evenings end with sunset it's either like 24 hours sunlight or like 24 hours darkness so that's how my life is right. my biological clock is right now just to give you examples of uh, you know uh, where we have been so this is me fishing you know when we don't do research what we do is you know we drill through the ice and then we do fishing so that's uh, that's something what we do so this is this was close to north pole uh, this is a storm coming from the left hand side of your uh, of your screen where we are actually crossing through a storm path so we are actually driving through frozen a uh, sea ice so below the ice we have like 4 kilometers of uh, ocean this is another example from the canadian arctic uh, where we are deploying where, where the instrument what you see is a cctv camera which is actually looking into the ice to see the high, how the ice evolves this is another example of two radars two radar systems that are like deployed on the ice and focused on to the ice to change the ice changes uh, uh so these these radars what what we see here they actually mimic they imitate what you see from the satellite so they have the same configuration same as the satellite so we use these surface based radars to actually like to study what we actually see from the satellites uh this is another device uh used to measure the ocean properties uh so we measure the ocean temperature the salinity and the pressure using this uh, this the cylindrical sensor which we actually put through the which we actually put through the ocean another example of uh, uh this is from the recent mosaic expedition where we actually we were actually at the north pole during polar darkness another example of uh, another photo of us uh, deploying an instrument close to the ship
uh, one beautiful thing what we see always see when we do field work are the northern lights so this is from uh, longyearbyen uh, in the norwegian arctic this was many years ago okay so uh, just just to give you an idea of, you know what uh, how our life is uh, not just me the people who also do research along with us so what is sea ice and why should we care about it so sea ice is just in, nothing else than you know frozen ocean water so if you if you take a, an ice cube if you take an ice cube tray from your fridge you add salt water to it you put salt water to it and then you keep it inside your refrigerator in your freezer and you take it out after like 10 hours you would see ice cubes right salty ice cubes that is called as sea ice if you expand that dimension that scale into like a hemisp- into like a big scale in terms of ocean and that is what is called as sea ice it's just frozen ocean water and, and just because it's it's very salty it freezes at minus 1.8 degrees celsius not at 0 degrees celsius at minus 1.8 and it occurs both in the arctic and in the antarctic in the arctic ocean and also in the antarctic southern ocean and in the arctic it can exist as far as 38 degrees north so if you go to japanese coast you can see sea ice actually forming there also or the sea ice which forms in the arctic ocean it moves and comes to it moves and you know it melts everything in the japanese coast also in the antarctic since the antarctica is a continent the ice forms around the continent instead of uh, in the arctic where arctic is uh, an ocean surrounded by land so it's just the opposite just like you know what i show here so the white regions here what you see they are the sea ice antarctic is a continent here while in the arctic you have the land mass the 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 americas here the uh, russia here and also the asian side here the eurasian side in here and you have the arctic sea ice forming in between during winters <coughs> okay so i'll just I, i'll just uh, give you some idea about you know, how the ice ice is formed so just before polar winters when the sun sets for like six long months in the arctic and the antarctic you have the open ocean and when the ocean temperature drops to like minus 1.8 then you start to see these you know small flowery uh you know figurines they are called as you know frost flowers so they are like the first indication that the the ocean is actually freezing right and when the air count air temperature continues to drop which means there is uh, there is less of solar energy uh hitting the ocean which means the ocean becomes very cold and the ice starts forming on the ice of the ice starts forming which means the ocean starts freezing and the ice starts forming okay and when the sun conti- when the sun when when there is no sun anymore then the ice becomes like very much thick and it becomes difficult for like the ships to actually like plow through the ice then have to they have to ram through the ice to uh, to go through this ice because it's that thick and by the end of winters when the sun is about to come out uh, the ice thickness so the, this this uh, this feature the ice becomes almost 2 meters thick so you have 2 meters thick of ice and then you have almost like 3 and a half to 4 kilometers of ocean below that and so from this stage so from this stage this in the arctic this stage happens between september till may so from september till like april not may till april you have like almost like 4 to 6 almost like 4 to 6 months so that's when the ice becomes 2 meters thick and that ice is called as the first year ice okay we call it fii it's not for for your information it's a technical term it's first year sea ice and once the the solar energy like you know hits the ice again then the snow starts melting because you know uh, then the temperature is warm and the snow starts melting and the mel- and, and then when the snow starts melting it's just like in you know, a house snow melts here then it, you get like ponds forming on the surface we have melt pond forming on the sea ice surface and when you have like you know water on the surface and when solar energy absorbs when the ponds absorb like a lot of energy what happens it it melts through the ice and it breaks up the ice so and then so the so the cycle is that so the ice starts forming in winters 
and then the ice melts again next summer it becomes the ocean again so it's a it's a it's a cyclic process okay but there are there are some ice features which doesn't melt it survives and it grows again in next winter the next year and that we call it as multi year sea ice and they are very thick it's not 3 me 2 meters it could go up to like 8 to 10 meters so this is an example of how how ice looks when it is like fully thick and this is an example of how it looks when it starts melting so there is a big contrast between how actually ice looks like right uh, when it is fully thick and when it when it starts melting so how does it affect us you know why should we care about it right so as you know in the students you you would be knowing that you know white features they reflect sunlight back into the atmosphere so snow and ice they are white colored features so they reflect 90% of the sunlight that is uh, that is incident on them so it reflects uh, 90% and it absorbs 10% of it so what happens when there is no when there is no snow or ice which means open water so when you have open oceans which means when there is sunlight when there is a lot of sunlight it absorbs most of the sun most of the sunlight that is incident on them and the ocean becomes like even more warmer so it affects our climate right how does it affect the ecosystem so we need ice uh, the not we we means polar bears or like you know seals you know they need ice for 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 their survival so for example uh, seals they need sea ice as a breathing hole so that it can uh, nurse their kids their puppies and also it can they can protect against polar bears you know who who are in constant need of like you know food in terms of like like help against predators right so that's how it ice the presence of ice actually helps the ecosystem so when you have like shorter sea ice season so when there is shorter sea ice which means more open waters it's difficult for like polar bears to migrate from one region to another it impacts the marine habitat so when when they can't migrate it affects their livelihood and it's greater risk for predators uh, so for seals it's a greater risk to predators like polar bears so that's that's also a big problem now how does it affect us so uh, you know you must be knowing that you know in the northern communities there are people living there uh, the inuits so they also need sea ice Uh, for traveling from one community to another and also to travel across the ice for hunting hunting polar bear seals you know because you know that they use uh, their meat for like food and also for uh, for their uh, for their economic livelihood also so so the presence and absence of ice actually affects the traditional ways of living for hunting and migration so this is why you know we are we need sea ice we, we actually need the presence of sea ice but over the past like 40 50 odd years you know i don't want to jump into more science from this but if you look at the blue line uh, the blue line has been like declining continuously and the blue line shows the area of sea ice in the arctic so over the past 30 40 odd years the amount of sea ice in terms of area has been declining like substantially right and that's bad for us to to give you an example so 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 this is the map of the arctic this is greenland and this is where the ice actually forms so if you look at, if you look at the uh, if you look at the the change in sea ice thickness over these past like 30 40 odd years that has been declining right yeah so this was in 2021 when there is less ice in 1980s you know we had like a lot thicker ice but over these past 30 odd years the, the the thickness has dramatically reduced close to like 70% right to so to study to study why we are losing a lot of ice and how we can better monitor sea ice that's why you know i was part of this uh, world's largest and longest research expedition to the arctic and it's called as the mosaic this happened in 2019 and 2020 just before covid hit us uh so the so this is okay i'll i'll simply explain you like you know what is uh what this expedition means so there is this this polar stern german ship this is a research icebreaker so it breaks through the ice 
what it did was over the course of one long year it actually the, the, in, in september 2019 the ship actually went to north pole and then it anchored on to like an ice piece uh, like this which was around like 4 kilometers in diameter and this ship moved along with this ice for like one whole year so they switched off this engine of the ship engine and then they install and then we installed a lot of instruments to study this ice piece and as you know the ocean is always moving so when the ocean is always moving the ice is always moving so when the ice moved the ship also moved along with this piece of ice and it moved for one long year so we studied this piece of ice for one long year using all the instruments that's already here so when i say one long year it also had the polar darkness when sun was not there and then we when the sun came out we also had the, the, the 24 hour sunlight so the the ship and us you know we captured all the changes that happened in this ice piece when the climate when the weather changed so that was that's a big long and you know extensive and uh, unprecedented data set you know what we what we actually got from this study so this was the ship and now i'll just graze through a lot of pictures just to show you like a timeline of what happened so in september 2019 uh, this ship started from tromso in norway uh, so this is a picture from the ship and this is a russian ship which actually came along with us uh, so the russian ship actually went first to help us break through the ice and then find this uh, unique ice piece for us yeah so so this so this this ship this russian ship actually went first then it broke through the ice so that's what you see here and this image actually shows the transfer of you know cargo from this ship to this ship so we you may say that you know this is like an accident this is actually not an accident this was actually like you know like cargo transfer from one ship to the other and i was in this ship uh, this whole time <laughs> and once we once we found the rice right ice piece we need to actually check if it's the right ice piece which can survive one whole year because the arctic uh, can go through a lot of storms so it can break up the ice so we wanted to actually uh, like find the right piece of ice which can be used for one whole year so for that you know we initially did some measurements uh, like the thickness of the ice if it was a very thin piece of ice we would reject it and then we would find the right piece of ice when we then we would try to find a right piece of ice in some other location and our challenge was you know we wanted to find the right piece of ice before the sun set because once the darkness sets in then we won't be able to do anything because it's it's very treacherous i'll i'll show you how treacherous that our life is when it is in darkness uh Uh, but 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 thankfully uh, before the sunset completely we we found this piece of ice uh, so this was around like 4 kilometers in diameter and it was like uh, it was pretty thick for us to survive and to make sure and to make sure that you know we uh, we could survive there for like one whole year yeah so this 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 particular piece where we would deploy all the all the instruments just like this so the ship would actually like park here and they and we would anchor uh, the ship onto these two locations and then we would use the whole piece of ice here to actually deploy all the instruments to measure the atmosphere to measure the ice and also measure the ocean below the ice to study the ecosystems for example like you know uh, would would you be able to find like fishes uh, right in right in the middle of right right on the top of a top of a planet that is at the north pole so so we did all these you know measurements you know in this piece of ice so you know uh, on the ice you know we had to set up all these instruments so we used these snow scooters or we call them skidoos uh, to to drag all the instruments from the ship onto the ice and from my research point of view you know we had to deploy all these you know alien looking uh, alien looking instruments on the ice you know these looks like you know these alien ships you know what you see on mars or on the moon but these are all like you know on planet earth 
So like I said before, these instruments actually mimic, you know, they imitate a satellite. So, so the satellite would be flying above us and these instruments would be actually measuring the same piece of ice, just like a satellite. So uh, that's what uh, my research used to do. Yeah, so, so this was, again, this was in polar darkness again. So when, so there was no sun for 24 hours, the air temperatures would drop down to like minus 50. There would be like strong winds and winter storms, which, I, which, I'll, which I'll show you uh, in a moment. And if you can see, uh, so next to these instruments, we would have these small huts, like a very small, tiny hut where we would monitor these instruments from inside this hut because you, all these you know small laptops all these they don't work on the ice because you know it would just break up because of the cold temperatures so we would have like a very warm small warm hut where you know we would actually monitor all the uh, instruments from inside okay so and like I promised, you know, I'll show you uh, what happened when we had the first storm. So it went up to like 90 kilometers per hour. And this is an example of how the storm looked like. I'll show you a video. The, the problem with storms are, you know, although it's cold, I mean, that's one problem. The main, the next problem is, this is another example of that storm. Just a video of it, how to show. This looks a bit less dramatic, to be honest. But like I said, the problem with storms is it breaks up the ice. So, so for us, when you, when you have like a broken ice, you can't do research, right? Because then you have cracks right to the middle of the ice, where you have the ocean underneath, right? And then you can have cracks, cracks right in between our instruments, right? That's also a big problem because, you know, the, the instruments can actually fall through the ice into the ocean. And then you can have flooding. So through this crack, through this crack over here, through the side, you can have water seeping through, in, uh, seeping through the ice and you can flood the instruments. And yes, so so there was one of one of these instruments. You know, we were not able to save it, and it it went through the uh, it went through the ice into the ocean. So that's uh, and it's not like a cheap instrument. It's close to like four hundred and fifty thousand US dollars. So that's that's a big risk. You know, when you do experiments like this. But even then, even when you when you have like ice breakups, you know you still you still do measurements. So this is this is uh, an example of the of the ice in a small piece of ice which broken up, and then it refroze, you know, because the air, air is still cold, so the ocean would freeze up. And one of our radars, you know, wanted to actually like you know measure the, measure how this ocean turned into the ice during this period. So this is the antenna which actually measures like how uh, the sensor, which actually measures the how the ocean actually across this small region turned into the ice. So we don't normally like you know uh, leave any opportunities. We always take the right opportunities at the wrong time to to get to do to do science. Uh, but you know we are not alone. Uh, so this is the storms at the time when you know we get uninvited guests. So these two polar bears, a mum and a cub. They, they 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 came to us for a visit and their whole hobby is to eat through the cables the electrical cables which means you know when they eat through the electrical cables our instrumentation is done it won't work again and it's useless so what we do is so we do some trishur puram uh, up in the air uh, we we shoot up some flares. We don't we don't shoot on the polar bears at the polar bears. So we shoot some flares up in into the into the sky to scare them off. But again, you know they roll. This is this is what they do. So you can't you can't get rid of them. They 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 rule our planet and they rule uh, they rule the nature. So uh, so that's 
uh, that's what happened during that storm. So in between all these, in between all these, there was another team in 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 Tromso in in Norway who was about to join us. Uh, so on their way, again, you know, they. Uh, so when I when I say they want they they joined us because this expedition was one whole long year. So the scientists already which were on board the German ship they were about to come back after like three long months and another set of scientists would 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 join them would swap with them. So they had to like so the new set of scientists you know they had to come all the way from Norway to join us uh, in in our ship. And inside the ship, you know, again, you know, we we you know, it's not just about science. You know, we always have fun times uh, to, and and we get the best friends in our life. You know, when we do field work, because you know, we see the best and the worst in them. You know, when we uh, they, during field work, you can't hide your emotions or you can't hide how cool you are, or how bad or how, how good you are. It just comes out because of the pressure of the environment and the loneliness of the environment where you live in. Just, just an example of the scale of how big the sea ice pieces are when compared to this human being standing here, right? So he is like six feet tall, and this sea ice piece can go up to like 12 to 15 feet up in the air. Yeah, and, and then uh, the new set of scientists who came in this ship, so we were already there for almost like four, four and a half months in this area where we actually doing the measurements. So we came and parked next to the ship, and then we transferred transferred the cargo because you know we need food and also other amenities in the ship, or it has to be constantly resupplied. And the people from this ship came to the ship, and the people from this ship went to the ship, and then the older crew, you know, they went back back to their hometowns, and the new crew would take over. So this is how it worked for one whole year. Yeah, and the the Russian ship parked next to this German ship and uh, and and then they went back. Uh, and when uh, another another funny thing you know when when ice breaks up us, then you need small bridges to cross from one piece to the other. Yeah, because the, the these these are this is like a two centimeter thin ice, and below that it's like the four kilometer ocean. So you don't want to like fall into the fall into the ice and into the ocean. You will die for sure. I mean, even though you will float, but because of hypothermia, you won't survive for after like more than like three minutes. After that, you, know, you will get severe hypothermia. And it's it's difficult to survive. Uh, and another example of how ice can actually like screw up like you know screw up all these cables you know what you see here these are all electronic cables which powers up our instruments so they all get like frozen up and it becomes like ex in exceedingly difficult for us to uh, to do the measurements And, and mind you, you know this is uh, it's 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 uh, this re this is actually close to North Pole, you know, which is on top of our planet. So all of the other people, all other people, you know, they they are living a very nice life when we are actually like struggling and suffering for science, a bit for science though. <laughs> Just to give you some you know, for more photographs of like how the environment looked like. Yeah, sometimes sometimes it it would you know, uh, be used to work late in the night uh, or late in the afternoon when it is even night. Then uh, sometimes alone, you may have like only one more person along with you as a polar bear guard who would you know guard us from polar bears from from around. But you get we also get to enjoy the environment even though it's very cold. We get to enjoy the environment uh, because it's silent. And it's profoundly 
you know, it, it's profoundly peaceful sometimes. And you get the best use from the, uh, of, uh, of the sky, you know, from, uh, from there. This is an example of, this is an example of, a. so this, so we, so we had a helicopter from the ship. So the helicopter was actually doing a survey and th these are the helicopter like lights, uh, the, the emergency lights. So this is an example uh, of a long exposure uh, photograph where the helicopter is actually flying across the sky uh, and the, and the, uh, and the reflection on the ice surface uh, of the emergency lights. So, and I said polar bear guards, they were like the saviors of our expedition. So they always used to like, you know, look around the ice just to make sure that we are protected from the ice. So they would have like shotguns along with them, but they won't, they won't do anything uh, at the polar bear. They would have like rubber bullets to scare them away. That's it. Uh, so if you can, uh, if you can notice, so this guy is actually taking a picture of somebody who is hiding there. Can you notice someone here? Yeah. Yeah. Vinayak, you know, he found it. So yeah, he's taking a picture of a small Arctic fox, uh, you know, who are also like very cute to see, but not cute when they behave. Okay, so uh, although we were, I mean, you know, I'm not a big fan of this picture because, you know, we are actually doing a bonfire on the ice. And when you do a bonfire on the ice, you are still emitting like, you know, greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, right? But, you know, at some, at, at, at some times, you know, we, we wanted to get some, you know, entertainment. So this was uh, Christmas Eve uh, and, you know, we were doing bonfire out on the ice. I also celebrated my northernmost birthday, uh, northernmost, I mean, in terms of latitude, close to North Pole, you know, I celebrated my, my 33rd birthday over there. So that was also like, you know, fun times for us. Again, it's a fun time to get some, you know, uh, nice pictures. Uh, again, don't, it's not a good role model picture because this guy is actually taking a picture with his bare hands, which you shouldn't. Uh, because he's holding a metal, metallic camera and it's outside it's like minus 40 you can easily get frostbite in like minutes and inside the ship uh you know we had like minimal amenities so sometimes you know, used to watch uh movies also where we would stick like a white cloth against two doors and then we would project to see something so that's how you know we uh, we we managed <coughs> Uh, our time. So this is uh, this was our team, uh, a team of scientists, you know, who worked together. Uh, so although we stayed inside the ship, we also you know did some camping on the ice. So we used some some days or some nights, we used to walk for like two or three kilometers on the ice, and we would do some camping on the ice uh, in, in in tents. Just, just for fun. So that's it. Uh, although, you know, we get, we had close to like 60 plus polar bear sightings uh, during our campaign. Can you notice somebody here? Yeah, Vinayak found again. Yeah, so polar bears, you know, they, like, you know, they ate through the cables. They, they didn't leave our instruments also. So they used to come once in a while and they used to scratch our instruments and, you know, eat our cables. So uh, that was also like fun and sometimes not fun also. I mean, nothing religious here, but when we, whenever we used to lose instruments, you know, we used to pray for uh, rest in peace for those instruments. So we used to put like crosses here. Again, nothing religious here. So no offense to anyone here. But, you know, this was just, just to, to keep us feel sane in that difficult environment. I was also a bit insane. Uh, so we had like, you know, these full moon days. Uh, so on full moon days, our objective was to shave off our head. So uh, in those four pictures below is me, you know, before 
I shaved off and after I shaved off. And that thing in my nose is actually frostbite. Uh, so even though, you know, uh, although an experienced polar scientist, you know, I, you know, I'm still not, I'm still inexperienced when it comes to like, you know, beating mother nature. So she rules. So that was, uh, so you can't, you can't escape polar uh, frostbite. I'm also, uh, and I also love cooking. So during, uh, twice during the, during the campaign, I was allowed by the ship's captain to cook for for the crew and also for the for the scientists so you know we uh, <coughs> so i was fortunate to cook for them also which was which was also nice and then uh, after darkness then the twilight zone came in the sunlight came in uh, so that's that's one of the most beautiful sights you can ever see where you have the sun slowly rising then you have different twilight zone like the astronomical twilight the civil twilight and the nautical twilight uh, where it's actually very beautiful to see the uh, the sunrise happening in in the landscape and compared to darkness when it is when it becomes sunny the ice cape looks very different the ice looks very different in terms of how huge they are and how beautiful they are Although, you know, it's, it's again, it's, uh, you know, there is nothing else there. It's just ice, right? It's just frozen ocean waters. And then after like many, many months during COVID, in the, right in the middle of COVID, so we were in this ship and we were evacuated from this ship uh, by this ship. So the Russians, uh, not the Russians, a Russian came, a Russian ship came after, you know, after getting stuck on the ice for many months and they came to rescue us. Uh, in the middle of the COVID. So this is our ship and this is uh, their ship. And, you know, we uh, we walked all the way from this ship to this ship. So people ask, like, why did we walk? Because we didn't want this ship to, to park across this ship and break the whole ice here. <clears throat> so we actually walked almost like, you know, four or five kilometers with all our cargo to jump back onto this ship and then go back home. <laughs> Another example of uh, a drone, uh, it's from a drone of uh, how it looked like. The, the, the challenge was, okay, uh, I'll show you this. So this was, so this, uh, so this was uh, the team of people, including me in green, and she is my supervisor. Uh, so this was the team who actually worked with the, uh, the instruments on the ice. Uh, we are still like great friends and very fortunate to be a part of this team. Uh, yeah, so on our way back, so we were on our way back uh, to, to Norway, back, back to land in the middle of COVID. So on our way back, we had to drive through this ice. And while we were driving through the ice, the, the fuel on the ship, went down to like 30 percent so we were not able to like go back without getting it refuel so another ship came from russia just to refuel us right in the middle of the ice and it took like almost like two weeks for them to transfer fuel from this ship to this ship and we were in quarantine so because people who are in this ship was already in russia like uh, suffered from COVID, they came to this, they, they actually came to our ship to say hi to us, which means we lost our isolation. So we had to quarantine in this ship for like two long weeks without much food. So that was also a bit dramatic, you know, um, in, in our expedition. But, you know, uh, those two weeks were also fun. Uh, so during that period, you know, we, do, we took like, you know, we, we even be, be we became friends with the other, you know, the crew from the other ship. And we also took like, you know, very cool videos, you know, uh, using drones like this. Just to show the, the expanse of how small ship is and how big the sea ice is. And, and this one here is actually water, like broken ice. And you have like four kilometers of ocean underneath. This was our whole team. Uh, not just the the team on the ice, but including the crew, including people who worked in the ocean, who worked in the atmosphere, 
this was like the whole crew who worked for this whole expedition and uh, these are my funders for my travel so i didn't pay anything for uh, for this travel these were all funded you know in thanks to government funding uh, for this expedition and i was i'm also lucky to be the only indian uh, to be to participate in this uh, this largest expedition so i am fortunate in that regard also and thank you that's all from me so if uh, i don't know if sorry if i was a bit slow or if i was a bit too fast but if you have questions you can you can start asking aar ko onnum chodikkalla ah okay <coughs> yeah so mariam has a question so her question is what's the energy source for when it is winter there is no sun okay good question so uh you mean the energy source for me or on the ship you don't have to put it in the chat in the ship okay you can directly ask me through the mic uh so the ship the, the ship actually uh, you know it ran in diesel arctic power so the ship had the power so the ship was like fully powered up uh it was not moving that's all so it was just idle but the engine is running but for us uh, but for human beings when there is no sun we had to depend on like vitamin d tablets we also had to depend on uh, white lights so we used to have these white torch lights which we used to keep in our bunker and we used to turn them on which would imitate sunlight so that was our source of uh, vitamin d Hi, Vishnu Nandan. Can I ask you a few questions? What, what are the main scientific objects of this? Other is it just climate change, or do you look for viability of other types of operations in that area? And what kind of instruments, methods, and what's the timeline for your inferences? Yeah, this? so so that's a good question. So I didn't jump too much. I didn't jump too much into the scientific objectives of this expedition because. that was not the focus of this talk so sorry for that no problem so the so over the over the past 50 60 odd years the the sea ice has been like declining like in terms of area and also in terms of volume so and that has been indirectly uh, affecting the climate uh, in terms of climate change in terms of uh, increased frequency in natural disasters not man, natural disasters like man made disasters like uh tornadoes cyclones flash floods uh, drought even droughts etc etc so the idea of this campaign was to actually understand the causes and the consequence of sea ice loss and how that affects mm -hmm. global climate change in addition the the data what we collected from this one whole year uh in terms of ocean atmospheric and snow sea ice and also from an ecosystem standpoint that would be actually used as input to climate models mm -hmm. so there are climate models where the climate models what we use right now uh, there are like a lot of parameters like variables that are non quantified or or less quantified or less accurately quantified let's say for example we don't have data of atmospheric changes from north pole from that particular point mm -hmm. to east of greenland across one whole year mm. all we have are from reanalysis model like you know recreated models so we the data what we have the in situ measurements they actually can be used as like climate inputs like model inputs to improve climate models right. that's from a climate perspective uh there have been already like discoveries about uh, presence of uh, a new species of fishes Hmm. that live in north pole which was never there there have been, there are also evidence there are also evidence of uh, ecosystem changes close to north pole which we normally saw in southern latitude because hmm. of the warming ocean and because of the warming arctic not just the ocean also the arctic 
the migratory patterns of uh, of of living beings living in the ocean and also like you know for example birds they have also changed simple mm-hmm. example is polar bears simple example, right. right from a geopolitical standpoint there was not so i mean you know we 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 took a route uh, to find this ice piece which was geopolitically independent not independent non invasive mm-hmm. right but still we had to go through the the special economic zone in the russian waters where we were actually not allowed to take any measurements mm-hmm. but still we were in international waters for the whole time right and that um, sea ice that you showed a picture of that um, circular in winter where it can pretty much almost connects the continents but like uh, going back a few millennia would that have been also a migratory path for human migration across continents uh in the arctic in the arctic we don't know because you know in the arctic the 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 the, the, the ocean is surrounded by the land mm. but in the antarctic probably but you know there are some 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 studies about uh using sea ice as a medium of transportation to uh, to jump into the antarctic continent mm-hmm. and you know having a like a civilization there but it's not it's not confirmed yet yeah thank you so uh there are so the next question is uh from arohi how do you dock the ship without breaking the ice oh good question so you have to break the ice so we had to break through like thousands of kilometers of ice before slowly breaking through the ice to find the right right ice flow so you think in this way so uh so you break through the ice right and towards your right and left you still have like a lot of ice right when you dock the ship you are still breaking some piece, some parts of that in you know, a big piece of ice so you can't control you you can't avoid that you you still have to break the ice but the good thing is since the temperature was really cold even if you break the ice it will immediately refreeze in in a matter of hours so that was that that was not much of a problem much of a problem how does the crew manage the wildlife yeah okay so the main uh, wildlife we saw there were, were polar bears and also arctic foxes arctic foxes are not a problem but polar bears were, were a big problem so the crew they we we had like sp- like specialist polar bear guards who are trained to manage polar bears so they used to have they have uh, short guns Uh, they are like the licensed shotgun trained trained uh, people they are not like in assassins or anything so they they have uh, so they don't have like you know this real ammunition or anything they have rubber bullets so first what they do is if they notice a polar bear they 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 inform everyone out on the ice to go back on the ship and what they do is they shoot uh, a, f- a flare ഞാൻ ലൈക്ക് ഐ സെറ്റ് തൃശൂർ പൂരത്തിന് വെടി വെക്കുന്ന പോലെ ആകാശത്തിലേക്ക് മറ്റേ പൂക്കുറ്റി വെടിയിക്കുന്ന പോലെ ദേ വുഡ് ദേ വുഡ് ഷൂട്ട് എ ഫ്ലയർ ഇൻ ദ സ്കൈ സോ നോർമലി പൊളാർ ബയർസ് ഇൻ ദേ ഗെറ്റ് സ്കെയർ ദേ റൺ ഓഫ് ഇഫ് ദേ സ്റ്റിൽ ഡോൺ ഡു ഇറ്റ് വാട്ട് ദേ ഡു ഇസ് ദി ദേ ഷൂട്ട് എ റബർ ബുള്ളറ്റ് ഓൺ ദർ ഫീറ്റ് ഓൺ ദർ ലെഗ് റബർ ബുള്ളറ്റ് വെൻ ദേ വെൻ ദേ ഡു ദാറ്റ് they they escape this is what what has happened till now nothing nothing bad has happened to them uh, apart from that so that's how we we manage them did a polar ever attack the ship a polar bear ever attacked uh, yeah many times but you know, none of them were injured none of the polar bears were injured and none of us also were were injured we are all safe Darsh is asking what was the most expensive material you lost or did you ever lose a tent uh the most expensive material we lost we had many there was uh, 
there was an instrument we lost which was close to like 450000 us dollars so so in so in indian money that's close to like 3 crores we couldn't recover it did you ever lose a tent uh, yes we did multiple times but uh, but you know compared to like a million dollar experiment a million dollar uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of instrument then this not, nothing so uh dilip oh, no uh okay are they are those radars machines still there no uh, we we retreated them uh, back to the ship when the experiment when the expedition was over so we took them back but there are other instruments which we which are still there out there still collecting measurements and they are transmitting those data through a satellite so we can access that data sitting from here so that's the best thing with technology uh, how did you stay healthy did you have to train to stay strong uh, healthy the word healthy is subjective here uh, i i am not a very you know a big uh, like a training savvy but uh, i was strong enough to to survive for one whole year uh, normally you lose a lot of weight uh, when you work in the cold because you lose a lot of calories you breathe faster not because of the altitude effect there is no altitude effect because it's sea level uh, but the ship uh, the ship provided us with like very healthy food not like junk food but with very healthy food so so we so we were fine with that but to carry these instruments some of the instruments you know weighed up to like 500 kilos so you know as a group you know we used to work on it together just to make sure that you know nobody breaks her breaks their back so yeah uh, another good question from mishana have you ever used weather balloons when you were there yes so every day every day we used to send out weather balloons into the atmosphere uh, we used to call uh, the balloon as miss piggy p i g g y because the balloon would look like a would look like would look like like pig so we used to send them up every day uh, to actually measure the the changes in the atmosphere in the atmosphere column uh, and since the ice and the ship were also moving so we used to we were able to we were actually able to measure the changes across space and time there are any of the devices tested or have or have they been housed before yeah we we, we this is not the uh, so that's you should send uh, messages to the public not as a direct message so uh, devices were tested before we deployed them on the ice so they were uh, extensively tested uh, uh, a lot before that any more questions malayalathil in jodhiya if anybody wants to ask questions in malayalam yeah so um, dr krishna i have a question so is this data publicly available um, is there a opportunity for students to do any project using this a uh, very good question so one aspect of this campaign is about capacity building so not just capacity building from a graduate student standpoint but also for students so the data will uh, is on embargo right now embargo means there is an embargo on it that is it's accessible only to projects members but starting jan 1st 2023 that is in 8 months the data will be public and it's free for every human being in this planet so you don't have to ask anyone not even me not even my boss not even her boss to to use the data anybody can use the data uh, and do anything with it okay um, so is there a list of projects uh, which students can try out oh a lot that's yeah. so okay. yeah so one year long of data one year long data means we had close to like uh, what there what's the next level of terabytes petabytes right i think yeah, yeah we had 46 46 petabytes of data that's like more than 1000 terabytes so 46000 terabytes of data so you can imagine how much data we have in terms of atmosphere 
in terms of snow and ice and in terms of ocean and that that cover and that data set covers for one long year and it covers close to like 8000 kilometers so it's uh, decades of data i'll put one i'll put that in perspective so in 1980 no in 1978 i think if i remember correctly there was a similar experiment called a shiba which happened in the canadian arctic in 1978 people are still writing papers from that and mosaic the expedition which i am i went to that's like 25 times bigger than that expedition so the data what so the data what we collected i can use it uh, you can use it alfino can use it vinay can use it everyone else in this uh, presentation can use it their kids can use it and even their kids can also use it what was uh, mariam is asking what was the challenge encountered oh uh, it's a challenge uh, yeah i mean everything was a challenge starting with personal emotional everything my personal challenge was darkness so it's not the first time i am in darkness but uh, in terms of uh, uh, the amount of work we had to do during this darkness that was that that took a toll on me so some days and when i say some days it means when you wake up for breakfast it's it's night in the during lunch it's again night for dinner it's also again night so you wake up in the morning then there is no sun then you get tired to eat breakfast then you want to go out on the ice to do your work still it's still night time night time then you come back for lunch you eat like a pig and then you go back on the ice again to have food and then you come back at like 5 in the evening and it's still night time and then you have dinner it's still night time again then you wake up again it's still night time and that happened for like almost like four and a half to five months on top of it i we didn't have uh, communication with our loved ones so that was another problem right so the only people who we could depend were our friends who were actually on board on board the ship uh, that was the emotional challenge the physical challenge was frostbite so i got multiple frostbites uh, in my nose uh, in my in my fingers so uh, so that's uh, that was another challenge uh, when the sun came out it was beautiful it was good but sun also uh, welcomes you with even more challenges when then then there is no night time right so when you wake up in the morning and then there is sunlight in the afternoon there is sunlight when you sleep also then there is sunlight so your biological clock has to be like fixed according to that those were the challenges i mean scientific challenges are like different but personal challenges are like in you know, a totally it's, it's very subjective but that being said uh, we had to keep ourselves sane so to for that you know we used to celebrate everything everything like birthdays christmas you know we celebrated uh, 2020 uh, new year uh, in north pole we celebrated covid also there celebrated covid in a very wrong way uh, because you know we were i think the only people in the planet who were isolated that time from far away from civilization so we celebrated that so we so we we kept ourselves same sane for like uh, like that in in in, in, in that way So is this project over or there will be a second part to this? So this project took 10 years to plan. So, yeah, so this project, or the overall cost was close to like 200 million euros. So 200 million euros, I don't know how that translates to, but a lot of money. Uh, we had close to like 250 scientists working on this. And ten again, ten years of planning. So to have another expedition like this, it will take another ten to fifteen years. Not in my life. Not in my lifetime. Uh, in ten years, I'll retire. But I was happy to be a part of it. You can watch this expedition on Amazon Prime. It's there on Amazon Prime. You can see it in Canada. It's called as Arctic Drift.
uh, I'll, I'll, I'll write that. Uh, you can see me also in that. Yeah, so you can watch. Oh, you saw that, Ishana. Okay, you can see me there, but with a with a different face, not the same person, but with a different. Attitude. All right. So, if there's no more questions, I think we can conclude today's session. So, again, I just want to thank you, thank you, Doctor uh, Vishnu, for coming, and thank you for everyone to participating. Yeah. If you have, if you have, okay, last thing. So uh, if you have any questions, uh, if you have any queries, if you want to jump into this field of research or in, into this field of career after your schooling, even maybe during your undergrad, or if you want to do like master's after this, you just let me know. I can, I can help you with it. I won't help you guide. I'll help you to guide through it. I'm not a professor to like you know supervise you, but I can I can show you the way. How should they contact you through email? Uh, I'm just so this is my email and 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 this is my phone number. I have WhatsApp in it, so you can. Anybody, you can email, email or message me anytime. And I think that's it for today. Yeah. Thank you for everyone. Thanks, Adrian. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Yeah.